So you might be asking, Darren, why have you not made any specific tip related videos for maths? Well actually I have. If you check out my first video ever, there are some maths tips in there. And that video actually recently reached 3k views, so thank you guys so so much. Anyway, you know it's true, I haven't been making a lot of maths related videos, but today is your lucky day. Hi everyone, my name is Darren, a first year medical student studying at Monash University here in Melbourne, Australia. Today I'm trying out this mic, so hopefully your audio is much better and you get a much better experience watching the video as a whole. So today is part two of the three tip series and today we'll be talking about maths subjects. So I was thinking about my tips for math methods and specialist maths, maths which I both did and I actually did methods twice. Um, but like looking back, the tips that I had for both of them are pretty similar, so I've combined them into this one video. However, as sort of um, compensation for combining two math subjects into one video, I have an extra tip at the end for you guys, so please stay tuned for that. Well, let's just get straight into it. My first tip is to understand the content deeply. Now this is applicable to both math methods and specialist maths, but for two different reasons. For math methods, the reason is that the content maths-wise itself isn't that hard. So calculating derivatives, which is multiply the front, bring the power down by one. Um, the hard part is knowing when to apply it. And this is particularly true when you get to you know, exam twos and some of the SAT questions. It's very story-based, very abstract. They set scenarios for you. And more so than applying the maths, the really hard bit here is interpreting the question and knowing when to apply your maths and if you even need to find the derivative in this particular question. Uh, particularly in last year's exam, I found that the questions were very different to how they have been in previous years. They didn't just test probability in the same way. You had to, you know, there were like graphs of binomial distributions um, and there was one very complicated probability question, very wordy one in exam two, I think. And so having a sound knowledge and understanding of the topics um, will help guide you when the questions are different to what you're used to. The reason why understanding concepts is so important for specialist maths is because they help you ground the concepts in your mind and also because special, the concepts are very abstract. So things like imaginary numbers, they don't like exist, <laughs> they're imaginary. You can't really have 3 plus i number of apples, so you have to come up with ways of thinking about it so that you really understand it and you're not just you know, shoving, shoving the numbers into your CAS or, or just writing them out without really understanding and being able to visualize things. So for me, I thought of real numbers as the horizontal axis and imaginary numbers as the vertical axis, which let me you know, plot everything possible. Uh, for things like Euler's, it's important to know that um, you're sort of finding the gradient um, like on the tangent and you're finding a point on the tangent, which, which isn't precisely the point. It is um, like the actual point on the graph, but it's sort of an estimate and you find a lot of tangents, you do smaller step sizes, it gets closer and closer to the actual value. So understanding, understanding that's very useful for not getting the formula wrong. I know a lot of people get Euler's a bit confused because the formula looks a bit abstract, but really grounding it in your head and understanding that it stems from concrete things like tangents uh, really helps you um, do well in the subject. And finally, for things like vectors, um, it's really good to understand that vectors at a fundamental level, all vectors are just a magnitude and a direction, and that simple fundamental thing, which is common to all vectors, um, helps you when you're doing questions with scalar resolutes, um, vector resolutes, with you know, balls flying up or like a, a plane going, um, like launching off. Uh, knowing that a vector fundamentally is that gives you um, sort of more confidence in your knowledge of the maths. Uh, so rather than you know applying vectors randomly, you've really grounded it in your mind and you can apply it in a concrete way and so you can do well in the math subject. My second tip is to have ways of checking your answers and to eliminate silly mistakes. The reason why these mistakes are so annoying is because you've done the hard work, you know how to do the question, you've worked out how to do it, you've done all the working out, but just one little tweak in your working out led you to the wrong answer and all that effort like is wasted because you lose one mark, which is a lot in a maths exam. So I'd advise you to have ways of checking and this is particularly important for actually both math subjects, but you get more time in methods. Methods is typically an easier exam, so you have more time at the end to check through your answers. Whereas for spec, what you really have time for is just to check your questions that you're uncertain about, or just quick checks as you go along. So have you labeled all your points? Um, have you labeled your asymptotes? Those small checks that don't take that much time are what you usually just have time for in spec. 
So I have some examples of checking um, later on in this segment of the video. But like with solving quadratic equations, you can try using the quadratic formula and you can use completing the square. So those two are two very different techniques and they use very different maths. And if you reach the same answer with them, the chances of like you having done both of them wrong and then both reaching the same answer, which is also wrong, is highly unlikely. With spech, things like reciprocal uh, trig graphs, how I did it and how my tutor taught me was not to use it, use it, do it mathematically, so not to find like um, the asymptotes by making the denominator equal zero, but rather to do it by transformations. So I draw the original like sine graph, I draw where the asymptotes are and I transform it, and then that would be my graph. And then at the very end, my check would be to check if the turning point's in the right spot. So I'd find the midpoint x point between the two asymptotes, I'd sub that into my, um, into the equation and I'd see if I get the right answer. And the reason why this is, or like a matching answer to my turning point. And the reason why this is two different techniques is because I haven't used the equation mathematically yet. So I haven't subbed in things into the equation. All I've done is use it to guide my transformations. And so the chances of me having transformed it wrong, um, but somehow having turning points that match the um, correct turning point that's been subbed into uh, the formula is highly unlikely. Uh, and so, yeah, doing this check will really save you marks. And I'll give some examples of that. And you should, I encourage you to try and think of ways that you can check the answers that you're doing as you go along as well. So this is the quadratic that we're dealing with. I usually like starting off with the quadratic formula because I find that the easiest and the quickest one to do first. So here you see me just applying the quadratic formula. Note, it's been a very, very long time since I've used it. So here I'm trying to think of whether I can take a square number um, sort of outside of the square root. And here we see the twos recurring, which means four is a factor. So that means um, I can take root four to become two. And I simplify the fraction just to make it easier. I also like writing the two solutions out separately so then I can really see them and make it clear that there are two solutions. That's the finished product. So then to check my answer next, I would use completing the square. And remember with completing the square, the coefficient of x squared needs to be 1. So I divide both sides by a negative 5. Here you can see the difference of two squares clearly laid out. Rationalizing the denominator is a good idea. It's cleaner, it's simpler, and in a lot of multiple choice questions, the denominator is rationalized. So essentially, um, either x equals negative one plus root 65 on five for it to be zero, or the other um, factor is zero, and in that case, x equals negative one minus root 65 on five. And just to really check whether this answer is the same as my answer from the quadratic formula, here I convert them both into a sort of one fraction because that was the form that my quadratic formula was in. I made a small mistake here. Just remember when you combine the two fractions, it's sort of like brackets. 
So the sign inside has to change. So yeah, the two answers are identical and the chance that both your answers coincidentally yield the same wrong answer is extremely low. My third tip is to really work out what works for you in terms of exams and for SACs. So I think for maths exams, people have varying approaches. In most exams I've found, people usually have quite like similar. You just work from the start to the end. English is the only one where there's also some variation um, and also in Lang a little bit. But I found for maths, people have very different approaches. All my special tutor advised, and he got a 50 for special and a 50 for methods, was to rush through the exam. So you should feel rushed and pressured the whole time and work through it as like as quickly as you can without like, you know, without not like, like giving up. Um, and then spending all the rest of the time checking um, in special, checking the question you're unsure about, in methods, hopefully checking through the entire exam. But I also had a friend who got a 50 in methods in special uh, last year, and I spoke to him, and the way he did the exam was he did it very slowly. So when he did the exam, um, to him, he would work through every question very slowly, read it very carefully, read it twice, um, check if he's answered the question, and then move on to the next question. And so by the time he finished, there wasn't that much time left, like a, a couple minutes left, um, but he did each question very slowly, uh, making sure that he didn't get anything wrong, or he didn't miss anything. I think there are benefits to both of these approaches. I took the um, former approach, um, so the approach of rushing through it, but I'd sort of gauge it as well. So I'd look at how hard the exam was in exam time. If it was really hard, I'd rush through it. If it was slightly easier, I knew I could take my time a bit and um, check my questions a bit more. So there are benefits and drawbacks to both approaches. I say the main benefit to rushing through it first is that when you come back to the questions, you kind of have a fresh mindset. Whereas if you spend a lot of time on one question, um, and seeing if everything's right. Sometimes you get too absorbed, you don't get a fresh mindset on it, so you might just be thinking the wrong thing again and again. But at the same time, sometimes you don't know how much time you get, how much time you spend on a question later on. So maybe taking the time that you have now to really make sure the question is right, rather than hoping that there's time left at the end, might be the better approach. Um, so my main point here is to work out what works best for you, and you do that through practice, so you can really um, harness that best method and perform your best in the exams and in the SACs. All right, all right, bonus tip time. The bonus tip today is to start making your bound reference early. And this is so important because I know a lot of people start panicking about the bound reference later on and panicking about the small things like, oh, can it have perforated edges? Can it have like holes in it? Can it be stapled or whatever? You wanna be start making it early and start having all your resources throughout the year because you learn content throughout the year. It doesn't really make sense to reach the end of the year and then start recalling content earlier on which you struggled with. So I think it's good to sometimes just add to like a Word document in your in your computer, um, sort of the mistakes you make, the difficult questions you find and start collating them early on so you don't really start panicking at the end of the year. Um, I know the reason a lot of people start panicking is because this bound reference seems like their lifeline. It's you know it's something they can bring with them from home to the exam, something that can save them in times of need. Um, so that's why people get very desperate towards the end if they're unprepared. That's why I recommend you guys start preparing um, really early on for the bound reference. Just slowly gather your resources, plan out how you're going to set it out. Um, and what I recommend also is to have a list of your silly mistakes as well. Um, because these mistakes you'll start making for different topics. For example, um, maybe a question asks you to find the tangent and you just find the gradient and you move on. That's a mistake you'd kind of make early on in the year and then later on when you learn probability you forget about it. So it's good to record that down um, so that when you return to it, when you're doing practice exams and for the end of your exam, you have a list of all your mistakes um, that you've made wrong um, and you know your weaknesses so that you can avoid them uh, in the final exam. So yeah, get started early on your bound references, uh, on your silly mistakes, on collating your hard questions, and that will serve you very, very well for this year's exams. Thank you guys so much for tuning in today's video. I hope the mic's been doing well and you guys like the audio. Please let me know if, if you enjoyed the, the higher audio quality. Thank you for 3K views on the first video. Thank you for 400 plus subscribers. We're getting closer and closer to 500. Once again, leave any questions you have in the comments below. So, it's almost holidays. Hopefully you guys don't have that many sacks in the next couple of weeks. Um, just enjoy yourself. Year 12 is a great time with a bunch of people who you might not see again after. So, it's really good just to enjoy yourself, hang out with different types of people, relax a bit, um, and good luck in your prep for the next terms to come. I look forward to seeing you all next time.